One time, someone knock at my door. A few seconds ago, behold, we greet you in the name of peace. For we offered that messenger, that bird which is a messenger, that bird which is a love bird. That bird is a bird of peace and understanding. And this morning, you're on a pilgrimage of peace, love, and understanding. It is for that reason Obatala came to the earth to build this earth. That it should be goodwill among men. That we may live a life that may be dignified and respectable by all. This morning, we have met with that love of the Orisha. This morning, we have met upon a junction. And as you reach the treasures of my door, as you have come with that peace, I want to offer you that same branch of peace, of love, and understanding. I shall therefore make three steps unto you. In the name of Oladi Mare, in the name of Obatala, in the name of Ife. And as I go along and portray upon this ground of peace, when the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and all those that dwell in I have a place in your mouth which is the signal of peace. But in the heavens, and even on the beneath earth. And they right there upon your soul. No responsibility of peace and love to all those who you have laid your palms upon within the gates of your region. I now over you and all those who have come to you with this peace of love and understanding. I want to, on behalf of those who stand with us here this morning within these gates and within the palace, to offer you this key that you may open the gate to enter it. Ibashe. I am an in the key. It is your responsibility to open the gate. Ibashe. Masaraja, Oguro, Oguro, Show, Oguro, Show, Baba. Masaraja, Oguro, Oguro, Show, Oguro, Show. Oguro, Oguro, Show, Oguro, Show. Mr. Scott, could you explain to us what an Orisha is? Well, an Orisha is really a saint, a devta, as you may call it in uh, Hindi. Um, and these Orisha 
manifests on ordinary human beings. Yes. Well, is there is there some main deity? I mean, above all this. Well, yes. Just as you have the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Just so you have Ulo de Marie, who is the Father of all, and Obatala, who was sent to create the earth and you have a elifa those are really the three godheads mm -hmm. and uh, from the three godheads well you know under the godheads you had angels and whatnot mm -hmm. and from angels well then you have saint but it is the same way uh, with the orisha belief system uh what uh what it, it comes down further i mean you have priests i mean what is your position in all this I'm, I'm, well, I'm a mongba i'm one who give peace and who have what you may call chila as you call it in hindu you may call god children or your spiritual children Good morning, okay. Father. Good morning. Uh, I was wondering uh, what what uh, what what you're doing here. I mean, this in this particular sort of ceremony. Yeah. Well, I, I am just passing across from my parish area, which is Carolina, which is just a stone throw from here. Mm -hmm. And I just see this action going on, and I decided to stop and, and observe and see what's going on, and hang around and talk to people and things. Yeah. Well, you, do you have any idea what is going on? Well, I know it's a it's an African festival. Uh, uh, Orisha tradition, some, mm -hmm. some, something to do with our, our ancestral roots. And I find it's extremely important for us to um, learn from these, um, these practices, certain, certain way of a new hospitality. Mm -hmm. A new hospitality will arise out of these people's celebrations, yeah. where they remember the roots and, and recall different things of it. Well, is, there, is there any kind of similarity or connection between uh, like, uh, um, Christ, the Christian faith and this? Yeah, there's, there's always, in any celebration in this mm -hmm. land, there's always an intermingling and a syncretizing of, of different traditions. And mm -hmm. they come together, and the main thing I find is that they're showing a, among, a hospitality among people. Mm -hmm. And they bring that, and that is basically Christian, that is religious, basically yes. religious. Orisha is a religion which came to us from West Africa. It is more widely practiced in Trinidad and Tobago than we imagine and has a lot to offer. Recently, Gael took a trip to Marabella where we spoke to Ia Orisha, who is a high priestess of the religion, and Dr. Maureen Warner Lewis, who is a researcher in African studies. It, um, there's evidence that it has existed here um, since the last century. I don't know if it existed before that, but there's evidence that there was a, a, a fairly um, significant influx of Yoruba people um, to Trinidad in the 19th century. Some of them, are, several of them, many of them after emancipation. And uh, this, would, uh, this would account for the strength of the religion still here in Trinidad. In other words, it is, it is fairly recent. Um, it, it, is, um, it has been strong throughout the years, it, but it has existed as a subterranean kind of religion um, because of, of its um, non-Christian nature and the the, the, the fortunes or misfortunes of an African religion uh, in a colonial society. But there, have um, been, there are Christian, um, Christian elements, elements in it, in yes, it. because many of the Africans, um, because of, of contact in a Creole society, 
were either compelled to or willingly um, became Christians because they saw that it was helpful to them socially and otherwise to do so. What I've seen here is, um, represents to my mind a very um, traditional, it would appear that it, 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 the ceremony attempts to stick very much to certain traditional ritual practices. For instance, I noticed the emphasis on libations. There was a lot of libation of olive oil and water um, and perfume, etc. Uh, the possession is a very um, significant event. Uh, it, it implies that a deity, a spiritual force, has taken hold of the body of a human being. And this is one of the senses in which the Bible says, and God was made man. Uh, so that in these rituals, God uh, and God's deities, aspects of the supreme deity, be take hold of human, the human frame, and be these humans become God. How did you get into Orisha? How did you get involved in, in religion? Well, at least, power start taking me. As what what, what do you mean by that, power taking you? Well, well, it's what we call it, Lord. Mm -hmm. I was getting a manifestation then, mm -hmm. getting out of myself. Mm -hmm. And as far as I knew, my grandmother sent me with some Yoruba people when they was having a ball. What, what part of Trinidad was that? Up at Bastor Hall. Bastor Hall? Bastor Hall, Cuba. Mm -hmm. And after when the drums started beating, I get out of my senses then, I yeah. have to call it. Yeah. And I realize, you see that, I will I fall with Shango. How, how old were you at that Eight time? Eight years. Eight years old. Yeah. That was 1922. Yeah. Stay tuned, still up in the Gael, more Orisha and Ramlila. Was your was your mother into into the religion? Uh, she was afraid of it because in those days they saying it's devil. Mm -hmm. She was one who said it was devil. Well, well, she wanted to beat it out on the head and all the rest of it. Yeah. But she never get chance. <laughs> what about your What about your father? Was he? Well, they all you know you know how it is mm -hmm. <laughs> with them mm -hmm. and they'll hide me away all about miles away and when the drums beaten and I, like i would be hearing it just next door mm -hmm. and i think one night they had a truck with me from rancuba to pastor hall and i think they, that closed them up for that you are uh, what what you call yourself now? You are a priestess, yes. high priestess. Yes, I hope to call it because what, I. What um, what do you go through to become to become a? Well, he initiate me by singing me, sing bearing me. By doing what? Sing bearing me. They give you marks. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. And they do soon you. And well. It was more than once, uh -huh. you know, from stage to stage yeah. until... What, what, what are, what, could you describe some of the stages that you... Mm. <laughs> you see how these things, you just really have to practice it to, uh -huh. slow, you know, uh -huh. to know, yes. This feast here tonight, uh -huh. um, uh, what, what, is, is this, what is the significance of it? Now, this is my annual feast. This is uh -huh. the feast that Paniza always put me on. Put me on a full moon feast. This is the full moon feast. This is the yeah. full moon feast because full moon was Sunday. 
put up my flags Sunday morning. So when it starts on, it would start on Sunday? It starts yes. Sunday. Yes. We had prayers. Yeah. Put up the flags and we had prayers Sunday night and Monday morning I offer for Anthony. Do we have when you offer for an animal according to Panis's teaching? You offer her, him, Rumale, and Manja on a Monday. So I offered for the both of them. If you are not given a four foot animal, you can offer on a Tuesday. What do you think the, the Orisha religion has to, to say to Trinidad today, has to offer Trinidad today? Well, at least I feel it have a lot. If our people would just try to get ourselves together, Orisha work should be, our people should have love. The more the thing that gets us apart, no love. You know, we should have love and unite together because everybody is one. Right? Love, love, love. Another value I think is 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 um, in in sense it's purely cultural I would say in that um, we have here a, a wonderful form of of drama and theatre involving um, music and dance and song and speech and etc and and plus um, ritual action and I think that this forms a very good um, it's it's a very good format for the kind of um, drama, drama that we would like to see, you know, um, that we, we in the Caribbean and I think in the New World and in the Third World are interested in uh, reproducing on our stage. I'm not necessarily talking here of Orisha being itself on stage, but providing a kind of format, a kind of metaphor for what could be on stage. When did the ceremony begin here in the shrine for this year? On Sunday. On Sunday? Yes. And what has happened so far? Well, we had the Sidang prayers. The Sidang prayers, you know. That was when? Um, Sunday? On Sunday. Sunday night. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then on Tuesday morning, we planted the flags. You know? Yes. Yeah. We kept up all night on Monday night with prayers. And on Tuesday morning, we planted the flags. We plant two flags here, one for Odin, the god of iron, and one for Shakpana, the god of smallpox, associated with medicine. This morning we had offerings to Odin, god of iron. We had offerings to Shakpana, god of smallpox. They take goat and birds, cocks, you know. So, how, how many goats in all do you go offer this morning? This morning I offered about nine goats. And how many fowl? <laughs> Or oh, 26. 26. Yes. All right. So, what else is yet to come for the ceremony? Well, we are going to be having our Elofa feast this evening, which is the offering of the bull to, to Elofa, um, who is who represents the Godhead, the God the Father, Elofa and Abolufa. So how many bulls will be offered? I'll be offering three. Three? Yes, it's the only shrine in Trinidad where, you know, where three bulls have been offered. How long have you been doing this ceremony like this in the shrine? For 18 years. 18 years. Yes. This is my fourth Elofa feast. Fourth leap year, we do it once every four years. Once every four years? Year, yes. So why, why this feast? Why is it done? Uh, because in Nigeria, at one time, there was uh, the, the, the human sacrifice, is a, you know, the highest sacrifice, you know. But after a time, it was abolished. 
and they began offering the boy because it is equal to the human. Tell me more about this, this feast you're going to see this evening. What is left to come? Well, uh, we're going to be having a procession. We start from the main road. Um, the vote is dressed in white, waving palms. We use a lot of olive oil and candles and so on. We, we may have the possession of Elfa, the Godhead. And um, we'll come down and then we'll have the sacrifice there, the tribal. How do you feel about this ceremony? I feel great. I feel great because it's a form of thanksgiving. of Oshun. Mm -hmm. um, why in particular are we celebrating Oshun today? Well, to start with, um, we just picked her because it was, you know, the point coming to August. And um, when we were doing our planning, it was the first Orisha's feast that would come up. But it was quite auspicious that we should choose Oshun because, you know, Oshun is an Orisha that governs all sweet water expanses, rivers, lakes, lagoons, and so on. And you know the healing quality water has. And um, I think especially now it is very auspicious from the point of view that we were celebrating peace, unity and hope. And so therefore Oshun is, will govern that, those qualities. And uh, she is a great mother. She has to do with um, the elements that work for nourishment as all mothers would nourish. She gives her children good graces. Whatever they want of her, that is, you know, for their well-being, she will grant. And two, she is known for assisting women who think themselves barren. As a mother, she knows the beauty in having a child, so that um, she would want to benefit, you know, others to benefit from it. She is Orisha of riches, and she She's very powerful in the Pantheon. Because we were thinking in terms of honoring the other water powers, as you would say, or Orishas, with Gemanja, Erin Lay, Peter, because you know we are into different heritages, and Osai, we were thinking in terms of marrying sea and river. This spot here, as a matter of fact, is the first time I have been to this bay. And in looking at it, I think, you know, what came back to me was that Oshun River that I spoke about in Oshogo and the way it is set up, the grove, the beautiful trees. There's a wide beach, so it can accommodate a lot of people. And uh, the river is quite wide and also was fairly clean because you couldn't possibly go in polluted areas to offer for Oshun. Can you take us through the steps of the ceremony, you know, from each ritual to each ritual? Right. Whenever you're going to do anything anywhere, you've got to ask Mother Earth permission. So they did have some songs for Mother Earth and uh, uh, asking permission to use the ground, to come with respect for the ground. You notice how they clean the ground beforehand. Well, that is the kind of respect that people should have for Mother Earth. Because, you know, in African tradition, like in all old world traditions, the ancestors are very important. So they honor the ancestors in prayer and song with the drums. And then we, they ask Ogun, because Ogun is the Orisha that opens the way. He's the one that goes forward to make sure that the life is clear, the road is clear. He's a warrior. And you know, you need your warriors to go forward. And so therefore you call Ogun. 
and you ask him to go forward and to clear the way for the other Orishas. As you saw, Ogun did come. <laughs> All their offerings to the river mouth and they set up that table with all the offerings um, no blood offerings they were all offerings um, of perfumes and um, oils and candles and fruits and flowers and cake whatever people had to bring and to offer they did lay a beautiful table Rivers come down, yes. But in this case, what we saw was timing, a particular kind of timing. They, they were on the beach, they prayed, they sang, they danced, they did everything. The river never came down. They walked to the spot where they laid the, the offering, the river never came down. When the river came down was after they had laid everything, they lit their candles, they said their prayers, they planted the flag, they, they invited Oshun to come. Oshun came, as you saw, in this great mother. And she blessed everybody and she received her offerings and she brought, she brought beauty. Then I witnessed something where Yemanja manifested at the same, on at another stage, on another place. And as Yemanja went to the sea, I got the feeling it was Yemanja. It could have been Oshun, but from what I saw, it looked to me like another great mother was receiving Yemanja, mother of the Orishas. And as she went to the sea, right afterwards, the phenomenon occurred and the river came down. And it not only did the river come down, but the river took the offering with quick speed, took it out to sea, because people were wondering if this was going to stay there for cobbles to pick or whatever. And some were saying, well, I like this juicy th thing I would eat afterwards. They didn't get a chance. As soon as the water came down, it came down with such hurry. It took not only the offering, but it took the table and all because that whole piece of sand, and it was quite a big piece of sand, just went to, you saw it, it just went into the sea. The Baptist faith seems to have been formed, let's say, some in, the, in, 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 let's say in Trinidad and the Caribbean sometime at the beginning of the, the, the 19th century. Because in the United States, you had a religious movement, a Christian movement involving a lot of blacks who would have Africanized their Christianity. After the War of 1812, a war between the United States and Britain, blacks, certain blacks, found themselves in the West Indies. In Trinidad, that one branch of that group would be what we call the Americans. Americans, a shortening of the term Americans, and really meaning black Americans who came to Trinidad and formed company villages. They are coming to Trinidad with this religiosity that is this syn syncretic religiosity. And they are going to practice this religion that is composed of the North Atlantic European influence and the African influence. Within the African influence, 
or the dimension of, that we call the African influence. There's what you call the Yoruba traditions and a host of other traditions that are West African. Iwe and Iwe Fon and Dahomey and so on and all of these ancient societies in Africa have strong religious concepts. What is noticeable too is that the mythical aspects of the religion seem to correspond. The, the, the Africans believe in God, they believe in saints, they believe in magic. All, all, all religions do that. So the, the natural borrowing and transmission of culture across you know, the groups is natural. Then to trade that is air to people who have come to the Caribbean from North America, and they are also of North American background and the same religious kind of orientation because Trinidad was a society to which um, laborers were brought. So from other islands in the Caribbean, similar groups would come in. Once they were here, because of the segmentation and segregation within the society, you know, because slavery or slave societies are pigmented processes, you know, you know, the, the blacks cannot normally frequent the places that the whites would frequent. So if the whites are going to churches, the blacks would have to have church formations outside of those structures, outside of the church, the, the, the premises of the church, outside of the ceremony taking place. So the, the, black, the, the whites are in church and blacks are having their services outside. Africa knew Christianity. Christianity was in Africa before Islam was in Africa. And when these slaves were uprooted from what they knew, their life they knew in Africa, and brought to the West Indies during the time of the slave trade. They couldn't practice their religion. After slavery, after the abolition of slavery, they were now free to practice their religion. And so the, Afri the spiritual Baptist faith would have emerged during that time when they were free. People were free to choose whatever religion they went to. Some went to the religions of the day you know, there were those who chose to be Presbyterians, Methodists, Anglican, Catholics. There were those who chose to start to practice again the African traditional religions, you know, like the Yoruba religion, the Rada, the Congo, and so forth. And then there were those who chose what they could remember from the African traditions to merge it with Christianity. And that's how the spiritual Baptist faith really emerged. So what happened is that they indigenized, you know, the Christian faith, bringing their Africanness to the faith. In, in, in adopting this, they were adapting, yes, but they were also trying to define or, or form a space for themselves, and that they were trying to relate to a God that they think will 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 answer them, and they were trying to relate to their plight as enslaved people and people who were oppressed. What we're talking about here is a situation in which a colonial force, in order to dominate its people, decided to suppress every means of expression that they had, including religion, which they supposedly felt was something, uh, an area that was sacred. <laughs> One of the reasons why it was oppressed because the, the ruling class elements in the society knew of its potential to draw people. The, the, the average service didn't require an intellectual to sit in the congregation or deliver the, the message. Sometimes the people couldn't read. Sometimes they were handicapped in very many ways. Sometimes they were the ones who could speak in terms that the masses could understand. Sometimes they were the ones who could solve the problem of the masses because the problem of the masses was the problem presented by the planter class. So there was a natural case for the Baptist faith appealing to the people. Once it appealed to the people, the people would continue to maintain the continuities and have the kind of retentions that we are talking about. I am a spiritual Baptist. And because I belong to the African people, the drum is mine. The timbrel is mine. The horn is mine. The conch shell is mine, because my foreparents used to talk from one trap to the other by the drum. But you might say the class of people who generally have been spiritual Baptists have been of the lower classes, if you want. You know, one doesn't see too many people of the upper classes going to, um, you know, the Baptist church, which is very much in keeping with the kind of religion and kind of socialization that we've had. Certain people, they are Catholic and Anglican. And because those were the means by which you got through, you know. The Baptist 
being a Baptist didn't offer you any great thing beyond a spiritual sustenance, it would seem to me, you know, and a cultural relatedness. <laughs> People at the time thought that the spiritual Baptist faith, you know, its adherents were too noisy, you know, we were uncivilized, and there was the thought that we were too African, and because we were African, we could not be Christian. So that was one of the reasons, and because of the way we shout, you know, we are loud in singing our trumpets, loud in praying, and so forth, the movement of the body, to the movement of the spirit, these things were considered unchristian at the time. And because of this, we were banned. The 1970 thing is a follow-on from what happened in St. Vincent with the Shakers. I, as I understand it, some important figure was on a horse. And when the Baptist began shaking, he fell or something to that nature. And that led to personal injury and grievance. And they moved immediately to say that the Baptist ceremonies and, mat and, and way of, 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 of performing their rituals constituted a menace, it disturbed the peace, it was gross, it reflected um, barbarism and so on. So they move in that respect in St. Vincent. And following that, the authorities here um, took up that pattern of legislation and so you have the prohibition. And with that prohibition, it meant that you couldn't gather and perform your rituals or have a service and that places couldn't be permitted to accept that or allow it either. So using your premises became a problem. Practicing the faith became a problem. So that people began to retire into the forest. Some people would pray and there is, a, there, 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 there is um, evidence suggesting that people would speak with their, with their voices almost close to water so that you wouldn't hear them while they are praying and so on. They would, the authorities would go into the bushes, into the forest, they would go into people's homes, they would ar um, arrest them, they would put them in prison. When we were banned, people had to resort to secret meetings. So, as I said before, secrecy and seclusion became the order of the day. Baptisms had to be done in the forest in the night. So, because of that, there was no, you know, no documentation, no formal administration or anything like that. Every cottage meeting, had autonomy, right? And coming out of that, you know, that has come into the faith even unto today. A response would have been coming in terms of, of, of attempting to justify what they were doing. And therefore you had these numerous cases in which the matter would be raised in, at, at, at the level of the courts. But there are specific um, people, and one of the things, one of the persons that I wish to draw attention to is Elton Griffith, George Elton Griffith. Uh, uh, um, he is from Grenada, and he comes in, and, and, and he, he, he's, he's, he is, you know, very much, he becomes very much involved in the Baptist faith, and he takes the matter to court. Well, Archbishop Elton Griffith would have been the one who would have championed the cause for the repeal of the Shouters Prohibition Ordinance. But he would not have been alone. He would have been the person to the forefront because everybody can approach government. But there would have been other people, you know, other churches, other leaders, you know, who would have given him that charge, who would have been supporting and pushing from the background for him to be the leader, the spokesperson in that cause. You know, and he was the one who really fought that battle in that way you know, to get the government to repeal the Shouters Act. Tuba Uriah Buzz Butler was in the council at the time, and so he would have been the one now to get the council to really look at the act and start the process towards the repealing of the Shouters Prohibition Ordinance. Butler, for example, was a Baptist, and, and, and um, he had a church, and, 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 and again, you see the kind of disparaging that went on. Butler was critical in the, in the early days of the struggle uh, for, for, for the, national, the nationalist struggle in Trinidad. Uh, he was elemental to the labor struggle. Um, at one point in time, Butler was, was the person who would have been elected 
to, 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 to lead the legislative chambers in Trinidad and Tobago. He, he was rejected because he was thought to be, you know, cruel, you know, you know fiery and, and, and all of that, and, and, and to be given to this kind of Baptist rhetoric. So that you had people now, I'm, I'm saying in the legislative council, who were supporting the, or bringing forward the necessity to ad, uh, adjust or, or, or remove this injustice, all right? But not only blacks. You have the, the Sinanan brothers, Mitra and Ashford Sinanan. You have Albert Gomes, Raymond Covado, and, and, and several people. But it became clear as the dialogue went on that people were simply being oppressed because they wanted to worship in a manner that made them feel that they were connecting with God. And so, um, with the work of, of, of Griffith, the, 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 the thing picked up, you know, full steam, and the, the prohibition order was, 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 you know, repealed in 1951. <laughs> In 1951, the realities have changed. The dominance and the hegemony that the West enjoyed has been shaken. Societies are being challenged by different forces, socialism versus capitalism. People are questioning norms, and they're adopting new forms and alternatives. And it is in this context that people um, are given some leeway to be themselves and to challenge existing systems and the Baptist faith finds itself now having space because this is the post-World War II period and, and societies are being placated and have, the British and other imperial powers are being softer. They have been battered and bruised. Colonialism has been tested and ha ha has been found wanting. That didn't mean that the Baptists had achieved all that because you have to deal with, let's say, from 1917 to 1951, 30-something years of stigma. And I'm talking about stigma that even today, you know, you know, could be said to exist in a real sense. Well, if you look at when the book was written, the book was written early. After, after I'd written um, The Schoolmaster, I began writing The um, Wine of Astonishment. And that was probably in the 70s. At which point the Baptists were not as acknowledged as they are now. I mean, certainly the Shouters Prohibition Ordinance had, had um, been repealed, you know, which denied them worship over a period of time and made them criminals. But they had not come into their own. In fact, they still haven't come into their own. So I thought it was useful to draw attention, one, to the Baptists and to the plight, but also it represented in a lot of ways the struggle of black people in the society. You remember in 1970, we had something called a black power revolution where there was a, 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 a case to answer. People were not being employed in banks on the basis of their color. Companies were, were closing their doors to people on the basis of their race. So um, it is not difficult to understand such a scenario in which the Baptist faith is, 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 is fighting in various ways to, to remove stigmatization and, and, and to have a place in the society against such a background. And, and this is what one had to struggle against and hopefully to bring it in such a fashion that people could begin to see it be beyond their prejudices or, or apart from their prejudices, you know, and see it as a group of people who had come together or who came together to worship God in their way from their cultural perspective. I mean, what are the Baptists guilty of? And if you ask such a question, you will get notions like the Baptist practice over here, the Baptist this, the Baptist that, and so on and so on. And that is the kind of negatives that flourishes. Part of the strength of the faith would have to do with the Baptists having a sense of value about things African, having a sense of value about things that they, they feel belong to them. Now, in any society, when you begin to subvert something that is symbolic of ancestry, people begin to question why. And sometimes 
it the more you subvert it is like a, a calypso that is smarty or a calypso that is subversive the more it goes underground the more value it seems to have the more mystique it seems to have and more appeal the more powers it seems to have to cure some kind of thing or to deal with some ill and that is the nature of what we're dealing with there is within it what people who belong to the faith see as its intrinsic worth and you can't shake that because that is belief that one people had to believe in it two they had to really be something for them to hold on to really and they didn't very have very much i mean the cath the all the other churches denied them legitimacy in fact a certain kind of um what you call it valued them equally there were certain people that in which white people were in front you know and as black people they felt had to feel a kind of inferiority given the nature of the society you know i think that this was a place where they found a home for a, a lot of people who, I mean, a religious base where they could feel free to be themselves and where they developed. And I think one of the other things that we haven't touched on really is the value to the society. Because when you look at the language of the Baptists, the, the, the hymns, the rhythms, all of these things have fueled the calypso and the, um, you know, forms that we've developed. But if you listen to some of the calypsos, you will hear the kind of hymn, the, the, the hymn singing, right? And in fact, it, uh, a lot of the early, even the early um, churches in the steel band areas were Baptist and Orisha. And some of the, one of the early ch things um, that the, the, the steel band played was, I am a warrior out in the field, and I can sing, and I can shout. And I can tell it all about that uh, Jesus died for me, bram, 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 right? Which was a Baptist thing and, and a lot of Baptist hymns. So that the Baptist as a cultural force were uh, very um, important in, in the society. It wasn't just like a little group of people off to the side. They were influencing the people around them. And um, they provided a kind of home and a locus, a place for people who had no other place or who had an inferior place elsewhere. Well, after prohibition, by that time, you would have a lot of leaders who were educated and people were moving up the social ladder and so forth, and then people began to look at doctrines and practices because of, you know, the education that they had now received. And, you know, people started developing, they looked at changing up their circumstances, building bigger churches. <laughs> Trinidad is a society of, of ethnic plurality and, and, and politics and religion have always been inextricably connected. Archbishop Barbara Gray Burke, her appointment to the Senate, her involvement in politics at that level. And of course, there is also the fact that in any scenario, any given scenario at any point in time, politics is always important. So there are a set of factors that came together. It is not necessary from the point of view of the question of spirituality, a political moment. But it is also something that is going to happen at a political juncture. We're talking about a, a, a juncture between the changing of the guards. Archbishop Barbara Burke was instrumental, you know, in leading the struggle for the granting of the public holiday. At that time, she was blessed to be a UNC senator in the government at that time. And so she was able to lobby the cause stronger. And because government had promised that they would have given that holiday, the late, um, the prime minister at that time, I think, was Patrick Manning. And then he was emitted out of office suddenly when he lost the election. So they were not able to fulfill that promise. But the UNC government, with Barbara Burke as senator, and being able to lobby that cause so much stronger now, we were granted the public holiday. Granting of the public holiday really, you know, took us to another level you know, another level of recognition, another level where people would now have to sit up and take notice. Members were ecstatic, 
you know, and we really went with that. And since that, people have recognized how much we have to do, how much we can do. And we have done much, and we still continue to do that. It would have meant something rather significant for the community. I recall that when this moment came, there was jubilation all over Trinidad. People were mounting platitudes, oh, congratulations, and so on. But I still think the society didn't understand the wider meaning of what was involved. But to the Baptists, it was a phenomenally important point of departure. I, I remember taking notes and observing what was happening on the, ver the day that they celebrated their first holiday. You had the Baptists on the move a lot on that day. You, you know, they were going to church. You could see a sense of pride, and, 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 and then one begins to understand the extent to which you have women involved in church activity in Trinidad because, you know, you saw Baptists going out in droves with their headbands, dressed resplendently, and so on, and so on, and so on. You could see the self-confidence. You could see the, the, the you know, the, the, the aspiration and the hopefulness and the, the joy, I, I recall a statement that one of the leaders used to make, weeping may last for some time or a day or something, but joy cometh in the morning. You know, you could see that they feel that they felt that they had come out of a period of, of tribulation. And, 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 and that was very important. <laughs> The, 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 the wine of astonishment is contained in the book itself. I mean, it's taken from the quotation, the Psalm 60, I think, which says, Thou has made thy people see hard things. Thou has made us to drink the wine of astonishment. And it talks about the difficulties that um, the Shouta Baptists went through, as well as, in a way, black people themselves in the, in the Caribbean. I think there's a certain sense of contained in it that both it's a triumphant march as well as one with a great deal of difficulty. So in that sense, wine of astonishment. And astonishment, I suppose if you look at the, the, the um, biblical quotation, you'll see you know, how it um, <clears throat> relates beyond that. The wine of astonishment that people don't expect to be treated this way, perhaps. Why are we astonished? <laughs> to be congratulated. Their struggle should be recognized. It's one of the epic struggle, as I said, in the history of Trinidad. It's one of the epic struggle against um, oppression, against colonial, um, um, colonialism, you know, against um, religious bigotry. Uh, one of the epic struggle for, for equality in the society, for freedom, for justice, you know, for fair play. <laughs>